Hope and Patience with Amelia Rope, a podcast about business, well-being and chocolate. Hello and welcome to our latest episode of Hope and Patience. It's wonderful to have you here. It's a Saturday morning and it's about to be filled with fizz, all thanks to a Christmas present which has led us to today's guest. My discovery of our guest began on Christmas Day when I was rescued from a lockdown implosion by a gift from my life saviour, Henry Acker H. H's gift was a bottle of the most magical English sparkling wine with a very memorable name, The Trouble With Dreams. The name and sleek bottle design alone intrigued me. That's before I'd even tasted the golden magic inside it. The gentlest of bubbles produced a fountain in the centre of my Zalto and the notes quite literally danced on my palate. With my taste buds being sent loop the loop, I immediately wanted to find out more about the person behind this brand and their story. And so they are with us today. He is the multi-award-winning English winemaker, considered by wine experts to be the most exciting talent in the English winemaking scene. The awards include UK Winery of the Year 2018, International Wine Challenge Silver and Golds, as well as awards from Decanter. He has his own boutique label and vineyards, Storrington Parari and Mount Harry, and is also head winemaker for the Goring family at Whiston Estate. So, time to introduce our guest today, Dermot Sagru, founder of Sagru Southdown Wines. Hello and welcome, Dermot. Hello, Amelia. Good morning to you. Pleasure to be here. It's wonderful to have you on the show. So, Dermot, you've been described by The Independent as the man with the Midas touch. How and where did it all come about? Well... I always imagined I'd um, end up making wine in France, Bordeaux particularly. Um, I did a couple of vintages there in 2001 and 2002, and I was absolutely absolutely obsessed with, with French wine. Now, I suppose that started when I was young growing up in Ireland. Making wine was my hobby, making beer from age 15. And making wine at home, country wines, was was my all-consuming hobby as an adolescent. So that's really where it started. But I guess when I I, I went to university in the UK and uh, in the early 2000s, I realised what was happening in the south of England, particularly in West Sussex, with um, with Nightimber and English sparkling wine. And I was blown away by it. Do you come from a family of winemakers? I mean, is it in your DNA? Well, I think within my DNA, for sure, there is um, the production of booze is a very, very big part of Irish history. You know, several hundred years ago, it's uh, estimated that every second house in Ireland had a pachin or a whiskey making still in it. Um, now, that's quite remarkable. So there's there's a very, very long uh, tradition of of intense um, alcoholic beverage production in in Ireland, and I guess I guess that's part of my DNA because I'm uh, my family name Sugru or Oshukru is from Kerry. It's from the Dingle Peninsula, and you can be sure that right there on the Atlantic coast, uh, a lot of families needed something to warm themselves up on those <laughs> chilly wintry evenings uh, that had gone on forever. I just I was turned on to wine when I was when I was young. I was turned on to beer making because I was just f- obsessed with fermentation when I first came across it. Growing up in Limerick in South West Ireland in the countryside, you know, wine, wine labels, wine names just sounded so exotic and compelling that um yeah, I fell for it hook line and sinker. Can you remember, Dermot, the first wine that sort of flipped you into thinking, wow, I've got to go and explore this? Yeah, absolutely. It was a Torres mm-hmm. Cabernet Sauvignon Mas La Plana from 1982 from Penedes in uh, Catalonia. And was that a gift or did you go and treat yourself to it? How did you come across <laughs> that bottle? It it's, sounds it's very a- magical. It, it was indeed. So we'd have drunk this in. So I was 16. So that would have been in 1990. So it was a great piece of opportunistic um, work by my mother. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because they were um, uh, doing a, the Christmas fete 
um, my mother was was uh, asked if she would um, take care of the uh, mulled wine stand. And of course, we were receiving, and I was helping her, and we were receiving donations, donated <laughs> bottles of wine. <laughs> and uh, this lady came and she gave two very good bottles, one the 82 uh, Torres, um, and uh, and the other, which was a, uh, I can't remember now, Marquet de Caceres, it was a Rioja. And uh, my mother kind of kindly took them and thanked the lady very, very much for her for her contribution. And, and they immediately them. they immediately went underneath the table. And mom said, "Don't worry, I've got two other bottles here. I can replace those with." So um, that was that was fantastic. And we tasted those wines. We drank those wines uh, that evening or, or over the, the the next few days. I can't remember. And it was transformational. That was the first time I ever had a great red wine. And it was a transformational experience. For so sure. you have your mother to thank, and this incredible lady donating. Absolutely, the two they've bottles. been, you know, they've been gathering dust for the previous four or five years under her staircase or something like this. So um, it's amazing, yeah. it's sort of serendipity, isn't it? In a way, you know, one one wonders what if you hadn't have tasted that wine that blew you away. Well, it's very true, and one wonders what would have happened if I hadn't met Archdeacon Snow, this this chap who had noticed my fascination with beer making and he gave me a bottle of wine and he gave me importantly uh hugh johnson's book his seminal Ah. book called wine and um once i read that book that was just a a, a, a opening the windows of wonder into 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 the wine world and um, hugh johnson's writing had such a profound effect on me as a 16 year old and uh and now today what are we talking about 30 years later I receive extraordinarily positive critical uh, praise from from Hugh regarding my wine. So it's 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 quite a remarkable um, journey, really. It's incredible. So, David, you sort of um, you did a very quick backstory, and what I'd love you to to share with the listeners and with me is a bit more detail. So you, I think you went to Suffolk to a winery there. I don't know if it was Wiccan. I I come from Essex, but my family come from Suffolk and actually on my dad's side we were ropes, ales and stouts we were brewers um, in Orford in Suffolk so we've always had booze in the house that's always been very important but you so you Suffolk and then you mentioned um, Bordeaux but then you you went to Nightimber too so could you just sort of share a bit more detail about how that all happened, that little bit of yes, the past. Yeah, cert- certainly. Um, uh, it wasn't at the Wiccan Vineyard, but remarkably, I was involved in making the Wiccan 2003 vintage oh, wow. um, at Shaw's Gate in Suffolk. Um, that was the year that I actually gave up my job as a financial advisor and moved down to Sussex to study at Plumpton Agricultural College. Now, Plumpton is the only um, university uh, in the UK where you can study viticulture and enology, winemaking. So I decided to move down to Sussex, and that's where I saw the advert for um, the, the, an assistant winemaker at, uh, at Night Timber. Um, and I went there with, with full of confidence because of my experience of doing the vintages in Bordeaux, um, uh, working with English wine. And um, I had an inherent sense of co- confidence, I suppose, because I had been making wine since I was 16 years of age. And, and it's, it's, it's really interesting when you learn the fundamentals of something at such a young age and with such a, a desire for discovery and understanding that, that you have when you're an adolescent, it, it gives you a great insight. And, and, and I suppose I knew I was just born for the job. So I got the job. And, um, and that's how I started my career, in, specifically in English sparkling wine. So uh, do you think that's what Night Timber saw in you? Because you hadn't, as you say, you hadn't completed your course at Plumpton. So you they extracted you out of it. Do you think it was your confidence that they saw and that you had been making wines from such an early age? Um, I think so. I think it had maybe been, uh, you know, the the my my general compulsion to, 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 to make wine. And, and I think I made it very, very clear to them that, um, you know, while studying at, uh, at, at a college in order to make wine was, was, was one very useful thing, what I really craved was to work beside experienced winemakers. And that's how um, I had learned almost everything that, I, that I'd learned in wineries up, in that, uh, up until that date was actually doing it in a winery, working in the, in, in the winery, um, rather than studying and talking about it in the classroom. Uh, I always tend to learn uh, more effectively through doing. 
Do you think that um, Nightimber had any idea of your potential, uh, you know, that you would become head winemaker and help Nightimber win numerous awards, you know, attract significant attention from wine experts and consumers, and ultimately it sailed to Eric Karima? Well, you know, I, I often look back and I think I, I, I happen to be the, the right person at the right time, mm-hmm. but importantly, with the right attitude mm-hmm. when I started at Night Timber, because it was a it was a, a fortuitous time for me to join. There's no doubt about that. Uh, the vast the body of the, the, the wines which went on to become successful um, had already been been made. Um, by the previous winemaking team, and, and and particularly by Jean-Manuel Jacquino, the the French consultant from from Champagne, who was involved mm-hmm. there right from the very very start. But of course, with the original founders, Sandy and Stuart Moss, um, and I helped um, bring those wines to market, really, and of course make the wines from two thousand three, four, and five uh, vintages. Um, so yeah, I I I think what I, I suspect is. You know, at the at the end of that period of time, that three or four years that I was there, um, I ended up leaving in order to establish the Whiston Estate. And, um, you know, uh, prior to that, I'd always thought that I was going to spend a great deal of my time at Night Timber. Mm-hmm. Um, but circumstances change. It's remarkable how your vision of the future can suddenly just, just turn on a sixpence. And that happened when I met um, Harry and Pip Goring of, of Whiston Estate. And you helped them set up the winery and their vineyard. That's it. Yeah, I realised that um, Harry and Pip had a tremendous passion to establish a vineyard um, and, uh, and, and, and a winery as well. But that was to come later. Um, and I, I, they had visited um, me when I was at Night Timber and we, we drove around their, um, their land, uh, Whiston Estate, which is six and a half thousand acres on the South Downs. And I wow. soon realised that they had an extraordinary um, mosaic of potential vineyard sites to plant on this this chalk downland um, in West Sussex. And uh, Pip's enthusiasm was ab- absolutely infectious. She's a, <laughs> originally, she's a South African lady who came over here in 1972 and I think, you know, came from the, the exotic Cape to cold England um, and um, and wanted to plant a vineyard immediately. But of course, it took many, many decades, 34 years, in fact, before um, she was able to, to make her dream come true. And I was very, very much part of that to, to come join her on the Whiston Estate. And we planted the initial vineyard back in 2006. And then in 2008, three years later, two years later, we, we established the winery there. And, um, and that's a, a decade and a half ago now. And Dama, is that um, where you make your, I want to talk about your own brand and private label, but is that where you make your um, bottles for Segru South Downs? That's in the winery at Whiston. Absolutely. Yes, yes. All of the, the, the wines, um, the Trouble with Dreams, uh, Zodo, Cuvée Boz, Brendan O'Regan, they're all made at uh, Whiston Estate Winery, which is where I also make a number of wines for other vineyards. So effectively, what I am is, is, is a contract winemaker. Um, so we allow vineyards to make their own wine without them having uh, their own winery facilities. So uh, we receive the grapes, make the wine for them, and uh, and then deliver their wine back for them. So I do that for a number of clients, including myself, if that makes sense. So, Dermot, why, I mean, I have to ask you, I think the name is just utterly superb, but why is it The Trouble With Dreams? Well, it's it's a song. It's a song by an American songwriter called the Eels, and there's a, one great line in the in the the song which has always resonated with me. Um, and it says, "The trouble with dreams is you never know when to hold on and when to let go." Mm. Now, you know, starting a a project like a, a an English sparkling wine project in the in the uh, obviously in the UK is. Um, is not for the faint-hearted, and um, it's generally for the cash-rich, um, uh, people who uh, either have access to a large amount of funds or who own land or yeah. the ability to buy land, and then put a lot of capital expenditure into a project like a vineyard in England, um, which then requires to be followed up by capital expenditure in winemaking, whether that's establishing your own winery or having it made at a, at a contract winery. 
and therefore, and that's of course is just production. You know, it's growing grapes, it's making the wine, um, uh, and regardless of the quality level that you achieve with that wine or that, that set of wines, you're still only halfway in your journey because you need to market the wine and sell the wine in order to turn it into a, a, a project that actually washes its face or comes close to. Um, uh, uh, repaying some of the capital investment that you yeah. made into it. So it's a really, really long-term project. It's generally for, for well-funded or well-heeled people. And, um, and here is me without any great capital behind me whatsoever, um, uh, trying to make this project go, uh, make it run. And, and I've often thought over the years, sometimes I've really, really felt like giving up. And and just and that's the, the trouble with dreams is you never know when to hold on and when to let go because you, you you're at the source of kind of conflicting advice from yourself um, at different times of the year um, because sometimes it's really hard. It's it's really tough and it is really challenging and and but I think that is so true of you know when there is that sort of very fine line of when you should stop something and when you continue something, what was it that made you not just continue with private label work and actually set up Segru South Dam Wines? What what was that thing where you just thought, you know what, I'm going to want to have my own brand, my <laughs> own voice? Well, as, as this comes, comes, I can quote again, um, probably my favourite songwriter of, of all time, uh, Bob Dylan, when mm. he said, um, I make shoes for everyone, yet I still go barefoot. Um, Good one. Uh, I felt that, you know, I was, what, 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 I, what I've been doing really for the last 12, 13 years is, is um, allowing millionaires become heroes within their social circles by enabling them to, um, to create their own wine, you know, to, to, to sometimes plant the vineyard, but turn the fruit of the vineyard into a, into a high quality English sparkling wine. Um, that uh, either becomes commercially successful or or doesn't really need to be commercially successful because that wasn't the the the, the that's not the focus of that person's um, business interests, shall we say? Um, and I always felt if I'm going to be creating these wines for for, for other people, the least uh, I deserve is to is to have my own label on my own wine um, because I suppose that that has always been. Uh, dream of mine and I saw no reason why I shouldn't pursue it. Um, just going back to your previous point there, I suppose it's probably the difference between, um, you know, very, very uh, well-ordered businessmen, shall we, shall we say, who, who know when to put the plug on, on investing into a, into a company that maybe the, the future is a little bit sketchy on, and those of us who are a little bit more entrepreneurial or risk-taking um, or just downright um, um, obdurate and obstinate about not wanting to let go of some dream that you have and, and always hanging away in there. I remember with um, Paul Paul Smith, you know, the incredible designer. I was very lucky yeah. to, to get to have a, a meeting with him. And um, he was saying it was on the 13th year of Paul Smith that he flipped it into being the success it's become. So it's it's interesting because there are so many businesses nowadays who have shed loads of cash thrown at them and they're this sort of instant pop and hit and then yeah. they sort of disappear off. And I do, I do believe you look at all these old brands that have kept on going, it's that slowly, slowly chipping away, keeping it small, keeping it small, and then it's those odd lucky breaks, those opportunities that seem to sort of push it on another huge notch to its, its next destination. That's, that's really, really interesting because, um, well, I hope that kind of trajectory will follow with Sugru, but it actually seems to be that case. You know, I, I started the project in 2006. The first wines were released in 2013. So, um, uh, you know, I've been selling wines for seven years now, but, but you know, over, over a 13, 14 year old project. Um, and it's really in the last couple of years, 18 months, I'd suggest that things have really started to take off for me. I've never really promoted the business. I've never promoted Subaru South Downs. Um, it's, it's been kind of just in, in the background. Uh, I've had some brilliant, brilliant um, resellers of the wine who've put it into uh, fantastic restaurants and hotels throughout the UK. I've got a very good ex um, uh, importer in, in places like Sweden and, and the US. But because the volumes are so small, it's been very, very low key. But it's really the domestic market and direct sales that have taken off um, uh, over the last 18 months or so. 
Um, and, and that's really, really exciting. And one of the, the most amazing things is, you know, we had terrific sales last year. Um, uh, you know, lockdown was beneficial to the direct sales part of our business um, compared to lockdown being disastrous for the on trade. Mm -hmm. um, and I've picked up lots and lots of, of new customers over the last year, building up into a crescendo in December when, when we had, you know, a huge amount of sales. Uh, you know, actually, you know, my sales in December last year were actually equivalent to the entire direct sales of 2019. So that, that's how extraordinary it was. Wow. I mean, that um, must make you feel proud. Absolutely. And incredibly busy. Really, yeah. really tired. Know, right? <laughs> how? How the heck? You, I mean, that's when I was researching, I thought, how the heck does he fit in doing private label for a whole load of others? Then he's looking after Whiston. Then he's looking after his own business and, and building that. But I mean, how powerful it is that it's growing itself, you know, without you really doing anything, it is getting out there. That has to be worth so much. Yeah, it is. I mean, I, I I can't take all the credit for it myself because I've got a wonderful lady, Elizabeth Else, yes, and she ta takes fab. care. She's wonderful. She takes care of all of my website, do, does Facebook. I, I'm not a Facebooker myself. I do a bit of Instagram and Twitter, but I'm uh, I'm, I'm not that. I, I go through phases of being very engaged with social media and other times I just want to run away from it and not listen to it and stop it. I join you. I join you with that. One really key question that I have is that you had your two seasons in Bordeaux. You worked on the 2006 vintage champagne at Jacquinot Effi. I hope that's yeah. the correct pronunciation. And yet you returned to England to continue your winemaking journey. I mean, why England and not France or perhaps Ireland? Because there are winemakers out in Ireland. There are indeed. Um, it's very, very simply. In England, we were on, we are a new frontier on the in the global landscape of, of, of winemaking. Um, in many ways, like, uh, say, 25, 30 years ago, New Zealand suddenly arrived on the world stage with a unique um, individual wine style, which is Sauvignon Blanc. Um, England, very much so 20 years ago, also arrived on the global wine scene with a unique uh, Venus offering, which was English sparkling wine, wine made in the traditional method a la Champagne. And, uh, and I thought that was tremendously exciting. And I really wanted to be on the cusp of something new and dynamic that was gaining the world's attention um, and be part of that, that, that new dynamic frontier. So that's why I chose England. And do you think that we as a country will continue to grow and be somewhere that people do respect us? I, I mean, I, I don't know what the French think of English sparkling wines. Um, there's a, a, I love the, the old quote, and it's, it's just brilliant. Um, about the French people drinking English wine 30, 40 years ago and saying, wow, English wine, you can taste the rain. Taste <laughs> the rain! <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, which I think is just brilliant. Um, it's so French. Um, but nowadays, there is nothing but ardent admiration for the wines we've been creating here over the last uh, last number of years, last few decades. But particularly the last few years, as you know, winemaking has become more and more professionalised in the UK. Um, and um, you know, we've seen Tattinger and mm -hmm. Pommery, two of the largest champagne houses planting vineyards here in the UK, which oh, is really? fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Um, in uh, Kent for Tattinger and for Pomery in uh, Hampshire. Um, not many, many people know that Pomery is the second largest champagne house um, after Mot de Chandon. So, you know, these guys are getting involved and, and that's because th they see a future in it. They'll probably be head. They'll probably be head hunting you. There's going to be loads of sort of offers coming your way. How does the terroir and soil of uh, South England compare to somewhere like Champagne? Um, the best soil and terroir that we have here in England is very similar to the very best that they have in Champagne. In Champagne, there's a region called the Côte du Blanc, and this is where Chardonnay flourishes in the southern part of Champagne. Um, and these are the wines that I've always been most inspired by. Um, particularly Chardonnay, dominant wines on the Côte de Blanc. And that's what I wanted to create here in the UK. And that's really why I, I, I joined forces with uh, Harry and Pip Goring mm -hmm. uh, at Whiston, was because of the quality of the chalk, pure chalk terroir. Because I think the, the, the quality of wines in terms of finesse that we can get from these, the abilities for them to age, 
uh, and, uh, and gain in maturity, but remain fresh and young and full of finesse and, and verve and vivacity is uh, on chalk soils in England is remarkable. I want to just um, touch on a subject that I hadn't really thought about, I have to say. I was reading Jancis Robinson's article in the FT last weekend, I don't know if you saw it, about the packaging of wine and sort of sustainability concerns. And what I was horrified to read was that only about 50% of glass is recycled in the UK compared to Switzerland and Scandinavia, which is 90%. Now, I was reading in the article that um, Taurus were suggesting a standard wine bottle that you could be you could reuse or recycle anywhere in the world. And there's um, Santiago Navarro of um, Gasson Wines, who's introduced his pet plastic flat pack wine bottle several years ago. But, you know, what are your thoughts on it? Because, I, that, you know, the carbon footprint, I suppose, transporting everything around. I think it's um, it's... It's awful. <laughs> the, the, the worst thing about the wine industry is having to shift it around the place. You know, mm-hmm. the worst thing on a personal level is having to, to lug boxes in and out of cars and vans and, and things like this. But on a massive scale, a massive production scale, the, if you think of the sheer volume of pure just glass and space mm-hmm. that are on these, these, these pallets of, of wine that are moving around the world, I think a move to pet um, is is uh, pet plastic mm-hmm. is uh, is absolutely going to happen? It's inevitable, and we just need to. It's it's a little oh, bit. It's going to be a bit odd. Perceptions to change, of course, but it's just like the 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 fundamental shift from uh, say cork closures yeah, to, to screw top. Um, uh, screw caps yeah. that started to happen in the 1980s and for years and years and years screw caps were just associated with an inferior quality plonk yeah, which remember is clearly that. garbage we all we know <laughs> now that some of the the world's finest wines are specifically in screw cap bottles yeah. because they preserve the freshness and the integrity of those wines better than a cork closure would um, and we've just got to accept that, that fine wine can come in things, vessels other than glass bottles. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it has to happen. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, sparkling wine requires a particularly strong glass bottle. So I can't see any alternative for that. And sparkling wine production is growing, growing, growing. So, Dermot, what would you say has been the most rewarding element to date? Uh, that's that's well, this year was was was. We've, we've won lots and lots of awards. Both myself and Whiston Estate have been lucky to receive lots of really top, top, top awards. And then specifically um, individual wines have, have gone on to do wonderful things against their peers um, and been, been, been acclaimed uh, for those reasons. But I think this year, um, or rather 2020, the year just gone, um, Whiston Estate won UK Winery of the Year for the second time in three years. We won it originally in 2018 and then won it again in 2020. That was remarkable, a, a great achievement for my team specifically. Yikes, for, I didn't for... put the 2020 in the intro. That was slack. And that's okay. It's break. Let's consider it still breaking news. Why not? Give me, <laughs> give me an opportunity to bring it up. So no problem there. But also, not only did Whiston win Winery of the Year, but... Uh, Sugru South Downs won the UK Boutique Sparkling Wine Producer of the Year uh, in 2020 as well. So it was a clean sweep, really. And, uh, and I'm, I'm thrilled about that because, um, you know, Sugru is suddenly being listed, uh, particularly by Hugh Johnson, as, as the, the leading uh, wine producer in the UK, just above Whiston and Night Timber, which is good, good company to keep. Um, and, uh, and it's, it's a... It's a it's a, it's a case of coming of age, as you were saying earlier on. You know, it takes a long time for these type things to pay off. We're a decade and a half into the project, and and to get that kind of recognition is is wonderful. What do you think you've learned about yourself from having you know your own gig? Um, I think you've got to. There there are times when 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 things seem really really challenging. And um, and it can get you down and you can suddenly start to feel, uh, you know, the all too very human um, emotions of, of kind of hopelessness and, and, and fatigue. You can you can suddenly just think, wow, I've been doing this for so long. Uh, I wish I could do something else. You kind of overdose on, on, on the subject matter that you've been so um, deep in for so many years. And I think you've just got to try and try and let that pass and not make any rash decisions 
when you're when you're feeling really against the wall at uh, at times, um, and and then remember that those those times always pass, and before you know it, and it's always remarkable, you find yourself in a in, in an amazing space again, and you feel all of that um, uh, sense of purpose and confidence coursing through your veins again. There's so many highs, and then. You know, there have to be corresponding lows whenever you're experiencing so many highs. And it's just about getting through those and, uh, and realising that the good times always come back again. What's been your biggest challenge to date? I think uh, financing the project on my own without looking for external help mm-hmm. has been the biggest, biggest challenge. Um, so, you know, I've had to take on debt. It's absolutely necessary to take on debt in order to be able to do the right things for your business at the right time. Um, because if you don't, you can miss out on opportunities. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've had to do that and I, I don't regret it now at all. Um, the other challenges are years like we spoke about the, 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 the 2008 harvest for the birds at everything in 2012, when I had produced uh, the Sugru 2010 and 2011, which are, you know, some of the most highest awarded wines in England, English wine history. You know, the, the 2010 Sugru was given 96 points by Decanter. It was the highest yeah, score amazing. given to an English sparkling wine. And then the 2011, the, the follow-up vintage, won the, well, came first out of 102 English wines at Decanter and won the Decanter Trophy. And then, you know, I was on a high. People wanted my wine. Everybody was talking about my wine. So it all sold out very very quickly and then 2012 was the coldest darkest and wettest summer in england in 100 years so we didn't produce any grapes whatsoever it was wow. it was, it was uh, just devastation so these things happen and and you know suddenly you're you're riding high and then you get a kick in the shins mm-hmm. with with events like that you've just got to learn to take it on the chin in mm-hmm. england you've just got to learn it comes with the territory you know it, it's coming down to more of a, a, a roll of the dice, really, with the, the variability that we're experiencing in climate. But I mean, yeah, I was going to say with climate change, have you noticed the difference with that? Yeah, I mean, well, first and foremost, the last six years have been the warmest six years in in the history of global temperatures. So um, it's no wonder that the, the quality of sparkling wine is improving all the time because we're getting the, these increased temperatures year on year on year. But um, what's coming with it is is just not desirable at all. Not in terms of a, a human scale globally. That's mm. that's just shocking. But um, on a, on a, just coming down to winemaking level or, or or viticulture level in the UK, you know, we're seeing seeing this this great variability uh, of of climate, and it's it's just really really difficult to predict um, in terms of late frosts, in terms of uh, of rain at, at, at inappropriate times because this is one of the big challenges is consistently getting a good volume of grapes and therefore yield of bottles from 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 the land just uh, skipping back a bit is it important to you not to get an external investment on board because i want to keep the project small um as you mentioned earlier on i've got a, a lot of other uh, working commitments um and uh, and i absolutely want to keep 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 all of those going. Um, I don't want to enter into a volume game with, with Sugru South Downs. The production at the moment is, is very, very small. It's around about 5,000 bottles uh, per annum. Now, um, I, I intend, I'm, I'm building this up with a lot of, uh, you know, we're still in the 2015 vintage. So there's 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20 um, in the cellar at the moment. And, and those, those volumes have been growing each year. Um, uh, but the maximum I want to take the project to is somewhere between, say, ten and 12,000 bottles of wine a year. Because okay. once, once you go beyond that, then suddenly you need to employ people. You yeah. need um, people to help you with a, a project that is bigger than that size. And, and I don't want that to happen. Um, one fantastic thing uh, is that uh, my girlfriend, Anna, who's actually a, a winemaker as well, she's the winemaking uh, instructor at Plumpton College. It's absolutely uh, her intention uh, that when she finishes at Plumpton that she's going to be helping me run Sugru South Down. So it's very much our project together. How wonderful. So quick far around before we head into the most exciting break for me. I mean, I've been I'm looking at this bottle all week and I've had to not touch it to keep well it done. for the show. So quick far around, Dermot, very quick. Optimist, pessimist. 
optimist for sure. Introvert, extrovert, ambivert. Ooh, ambivert. I, I've never heard that That's before. That's a mix. That's I'd just la- a fancy word for mixing. I think, I'd go, I think I'd go for ambivert then for sure because, um, yeah, it goes with the seasons, but an ambivert <laughs> with a tendency to be an extrovert for sure. Perfectionist or non-perfectionist? Um, I accept chaos. Okay. Um, yeah. Early bird or night owl? Uh, night owl. I think I, 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 I tend to come, come alive towards the evening. My brain uh, is more furious in the, in the evenings, yeah. Right, OK, so this is it. This is the most exciting... I shouldn't say this, I love chocolate, but it's a very exciting <laughs> break because we are going to be trying Curve Dr. Brendan O'Regan. Oh, Regan. Regan. Yes, Regan. Why do I keep getting that wrong? I... Uh, well, it's, it's, it's mental... if you think of Ronald Reagan, we used to all say Ronald Reagan. And this is um, Regan. Regan. A very, very interesting thing used to happen when, um, when the Irish were emigrating to the US. Um, you and keep chatting reasonable... because I'm opening my bottle. <laughs> OK, I will indeed. And I'm opening mine. Um, so very on the border, um, they would add an A to the first part of the, the oh, surname in order to bump good. them up on the alphabetical order list to get <laughs> in earlier. So hence O'Regan, or E-G-A-N, became O'Regan. And um, there is speculation that Ronald himself is part of the family tree. Who or, knows? Or we, he could be. Anyway, we, yeah. you tell us, I'm pouring out this sweet nectar that was a very generous gift to me, not from Dermot, so it's not bribery and corruption, just in case our listeners are thinking yeah. that I'm being bribed. And, oh, my God, the smell. I don't have any of the language. I'm sorry if you're wine buffs listening to this. I'm limited on wine knowledge. Or oh, knowledge is just the descriptive flavours of it. But, you know, what I, what I love is the, it's just the way that the bubbles fountain up. And it's, the smell is so rich. I mean, it's, it is utter heaven. I want to taste it. And I want Dermot to tell us a little bit about this, but also importantly about your grand uncle, which I've learned is the Irish equivalent of great uncle, who was a serious mover and shaker in the duty field. Few oh goodness, I haven't even had a sip yet. Yeah, you duty, haven't even started a duty free world. Right, you crack on, Dermot, because I'm just going to wallow in this biggest treat and highlight of my year. Good. Excellent. Enjoy. Enjoy. Um, mm. Dr. Brendan O'Regan um, was my, my, my what I call my gr- my grand uncle, um, or as you say, great uncle. Um, he was my grandmother's brother. Oh, and, wow. Um, it just, sorry, just just to butt him. It gives you, it's just absolutely sublime. I mean, the, it's, it's, wow. The way the flavour just develops, it's incredible. Yeah, it's wonderful. Citrus, shortbread. A bit of honey, absolutely. So stone fruit, like apricot and peach. Um, great minerality coming through. So a sense of this chalky oh, uh, soil, a salinity with the, the sweetness of the wine as well. Mm. Sorry, get back into mm. bread. I, I can't, can't do I can't. that slurping. Yeah, bit. I'd love okay. to. That's de goose. Is it de goose? What's it called? Degustation, something where you 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 Degustation. do Well, it's just about spelling. bringing some air in, bringing um, some air into your mouth without the wine dribbling out down the front. Okay, of your so shirt. tell me how you That's do that, key. just quickly. Uh, I think just tilt, tilt your head back a little bit <laughs> and make sure that the wine's at the back of your <laughs> mouth when you when you suck in a little bit of air because that helps. It's it's uh, air brings out the aromas more in your mouth, and uh, and allows you to smell the wine better when the wine is actually inside your mouth because that's oh. really what's happening when you're tasting. You're really smelling the wine with your olfactory bulb. Um, this is gorgeous. Uh, I haven't uh, tasted a bottle of this since before Christmas, so um, uh, it's a it's a treat for me as well to to grab one out of the, out of the cellar last oh. night. Um, Brendan O'Regan yes. um, established the world's first duty-free shop at Shannon Airport in 1947. Um, he did this because he realized after the Second World War that technology of airplanes had uh, increased so that they didn't need to stop over when flying to the US to Europe. They would always stop at Shannon Airport um, in order to refuel, because it's one of Europe's most westerly airports. And um, when they were refueling, this was a very, very useful uh, thing for the local economy, but then they started to fly over. So Brendan wished to give them a reason to continue landing at Shannon Airport. So what he did was he built up 
um, a tourism uh, center um, and uh, an enterprise free zone for industry around Shannon Airport. And he encouraged as much tourism as possible. And one of the, the ways he did that was by creating the first ever duty free shop. So perfumes and cameras and cigarettes and alcohol, of course, um, uh, were, were available duty free. And it was that very model that was started by Brendan in, in Shannon in 47, that has spread throughout the rest of the world and created the, uh, the global duty-free industry that we have today. What a man and what a bottle of fizz. I mean, I would recommend this beyond. It's just absolutely sublime. It's heaven. I wanted to celebrate and commemorate his his hundredth um, centenary, his anniversary in 2017, and I thought there's no greater way really than than to make the the top top cuvee that I can make. And now we've got to crack on with the rest of the podcast before we get too sidetracked. So. It is after midday. Come on. It It is is. after midday. It is now. It shouldn't be. We should have rattled (laughs) along much quicker. But the thing is that I could chat to you all day. Um, Actually, there's something rather nice about champagne, I think, in the morning or at midday rather than at the end of the day. I I don't know why that is. it's invigorating. I think it's the bubbles and the way it gives you, um, well, it gives you that hit. I mean, everybody talks about how wonderful um, wine is and, you know, the sense of flavors and tastes and characters and things like this. You can't ignore the, the role that alcohol plays in wine. That would be um, that would be criminal, really. And I think <laughs> it's the way that um, the bubbles um, just get into your bloodstream very, very quickly indeed and give that, that, that little endorphin hit. Yeah, that um, little sort of bit of vavavum. Absolutely. Right, absolutely. talk about vavavum, Dermot. What are your thoughts on success and failure? Wow. Um, what are my thoughts on success and failure? I think that they come hand in hand, really. Um, you know, you can you can be very, very successful at some things and, and you can be dying a death on other things. And I've had that in the past when I've been winning awards, yet uh, you, you're knowing my, the balance sheet of my business was absolutely, absolutely in a desperate, desperate state. So um, I think you've got to, to remain realistic and, um, and let the two of them be bedfellows. On to your well-being. I'm hoping that you do look after yourself. Uh, I've heard that you are an avid cyclist. Do you still have a chance to cycle and take time out? I do. I do. And it's it's increasingly important to me um, as I get older. I used to cycle um, at a very, very high national level in Ireland between really? the ages of nine and 16. Yeah. Um, I come from a family of, of road racing cyclists. Um, so long before... Um, uh, Bradley Wiggins and Geraint Thomas and people like this were, were, were global superstars in Ireland in the 1980s. Myself and my brothers raced bicycles a, an awful lot. And, um, and now I stopped, I stopped riding when I was 16 and started making booze. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, now when I ride my bike, I feel like a kid. I feel like an adolescent every time I get on my, my bike and, and either ride on the roads here in Suffolk, uh, in Sussex rather, um, or on the South Downs on my mountain bike. It just makes me feel like a kid. So there's, there's nothing, nothing better than doing that. It's this wonderful, bittersweet blend of endorphins and pain. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that it's that thing where you, when one works out, is that pain. What triggers your stress, Dermot, and how does it affect you physically and mentally or mm. either or? Um, generally, I've, I'm very good at dealing with stress. I've got broad shoulders and I'm able to react to, um, well, certainly on a, a winemaking scenario, you know, things happen uh, in the moment when, when you're making wine, especially at times like harvest and bottling. You're extremely busy. You're doing lots and lots of critical operations, um, uh, sometimes at the same time, but all in very, very quick succession that can have big uh, implications on the wines that you're you're making or the fruit that you're processing, and uh, I tend to have a very very uh, stable um, attitude and uh, uh, to, to dealing with any any situations. Then I don't panic. I manage to be very calm and focused and think through things well. Um, then there's the other more kind of insidious uh, things that keep you awake at night. Um, I tend to. Um, dream about things that I don't yet know I'm worried about. Things lurk in my subconscious and, mm. and, and make me lose sleep. I think we, that happens to us all. 
And, um, and that's a tough one, dealing with that one. But those, those problems then usually come to the surface and you're able to deal with them, those concerns or worries that you have. Yeah, I think the best way, one of the best ways, and you know, we all need to, 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 to take care and be aware of our mental health, particularly these days. Mm-hmm. There are tough times that we're living through at the moment. Yep. They kind of extended lockdown. And it's the, one of the worst things about it. You know, I'm speaking here at the, the end of January is to try and find something in the future to look forward to. Because I know. At the moment, there's no that, planning. There's no planning. There's there's nothing really out there that you can say. Oh well, there's a finish line. There's yeah. uh, there's 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 a reward for all of this patience and and um, and conscientiousness during these times. It's 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 really really difficult. I think we've just got to make make take it take it kind of literally day by day, but week by week, and and try and get through this. And I think the impact on on people's mental health is now starting to emerge um, because. Uh, it's 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 very abnormal. I mean, I'm a highly sociable person. My girlfriend is a highly sociable person. We're we're used to um, either through just socialising or at work, mixing with a lot of people, mm. travelling abroad, doing events, uh, going on holiday for sure. But just in our working lives, doing all of these things, and that that creates the diversity of life that keeps us all sustained and going. And, and without that, it's challenging. Uh, so yeah. exercise is fundamentally important for me I, I i need to get out on my bike and do an hour and a half two hours two and a half hours of and, and just exhaust myself and that has an amazing regenerative effect on myself i find Dermot, where because the show is called hope and patience where have yeah. you had to have hope do you think and also patience Mm, well, wine is all about patience, especially sparkling wine, because it takes time. And um, I often think of chefs and just how completely opposite w- w- it is to winemaking, because chefs do things at an incredible pace on the moment, in the moment, to be able to deliver, you know, 20, 50, 100 covers of food to, for, for, for waiting ta- tables. Whereas winemaking, the, the sense of, of, of time is just completely the polar opposite. You know, I put, I put, what we're drinking here is from the 2016 vintage, but it's got reserve wine from 2009 in it. You know, it's something that's over a decade in the making. Uh, and I'm very, very used to that kind of uh, patience. Hope is, uh, is, I think, something that hope, I think, goes along with confidence for me. Mm-hmm. You know, when I started the, 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 the project, um, at Wiston Estate and making the Sugru wines. Yeah, I was remarkably confident. I had no real question or what's the word? I had no um, contemplation of, of failure. I'll be absolutely honest. Mm-hmm. I knew back then that I was going to produce the best wines in England. Um, and uh, I guess that's hope born of a certain confidence and of, uh, uh, you know, a sense that I was accumulating experience at a very, very uh, extraordinary rate um, that I'd be able to put, 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 put together the pieces of the puzzle in terms of vineyard, uh, quality of grapes, experience of how to make that work in wine and then patience to give it time in the cellar. To, 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 and it comes down to trust. You've got to trust yourself in winemaking. You really do. You will second guess yourself, but you've got to go with your instinct and, uh, and make the right decisions. And, uh, and thankfully, that has, um, has come true for me over the years. So finally, Dermot, would you share with the listeners where they can find you? Also, anything new that you've got in the pipeline too? Yeah, I've got some very, very interesting um, new releases coming up. Um, so my website is the best place to buy the wines. And that's very simply, that's just my name. So it's dermotsugru.com, D-E-R-M-O-T-S-U-G-R-U-E.com. Sue Grew. Think of a little girl called Sue who grew. Um, because some people find <laughs> it very spell confusing. spell it in a slightly different way. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so dermotsugra.com and then you can buy, you know, next day delivery throughout the UK. Um, Trouble with Dreams 2015 is the current release. Brendan O'Regan that we've been tasting here today, which is tasting majestic, actually. It's uh, wonderful to be oh, tasting it's again. Heaven. Thank you Utter for heaven. that, Amelia. Um, and, um, and then there's two new wines coming on, on board very, very soon. Um, there is Zodo, which is um, zero dosage English sparkling wine. And this is a really, really tough style to make. So I've been, it's, it's, I've been working on a prototype of this wine for the last, well, three years now. 
and um, it is zero dosage, so it's sugar free. Um, so there's no um, sugar added at the end of the uh, winemaking process at disgorging and dosage. So it makes the wine naturally very dry, um, but it gives the wine a saltiness and a fantastic food matching uh, capability. Uh, and that is, it's tough to do because of the acidity of English sparkling wine. You really need high quality wine that is very, very uh, creamy and mellifluous in its texture for it to be able to work. So Zodo is there. But then there's another special project, which is again celebrating a mem member of my family, and that is Cuvée Boz, um, which is from the 2015 vintage. It's a Chardonnay. 100% um, Chardonnay blend, a Blonde Blanc, and the first one, first Blonde Blanc that Sugarsat Downs is releasing. Uh, QA Ball is named after my brother, who who the um, who passed away sadly uh, almost exactly one decade ago in uh, February uh, 2011. So I've named Boz. Um, uh, I've named him in the in the honor of of Boz, my brother. Um, this this Blonde Blanc. So um, yeah, two very very exciting new wines coming on the scene. Well, they are definitely going on my wish list and I'm sure your brother would be so proud that his essence and spirit has been captured into a bottle that we can all enjoy and share his your memories of him too. So that's incredible. And then you also have an Instagram. Do you do Instagram, Dermot? I do indeed, yes. My Instagram is uh, at Ermosug, E-R-M-O-S-U-G. And... Um... Uh, yeah, and also on Twitter at Dermot Suguru as well. Thank you, Dermot, so much for joining me when you are super busy on a Saturday morning. And I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And I hope you've enjoyed it too. Absolutely, Amelia. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, lovely to talk to you. And um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your cuvee, Dr. Brendan O'Regan, uh, later this afternoon and evening. <laughs> yeah, I am. I'm going to pace myself. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Amelia. Thank you, Dermot. Anyway, before I go, it's time for my book recommendation and quote for this episode. The book is Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, the Roman emperor who is a devoted reader and thinker. And it's a book literally of reflections. It's very good. And the quote is from Marcus Aurelius. Don't be ashamed to need help. Like a soldier storming a wall, you have a mission to accomplish. And if you've been wounded and you need a comrade to pull you up, so what? A huge thank you for finding the show. I hope you enjoyed the chat. Don't forget to subscribe to get the latest episode. And if you're enjoying the show, it would be truly fab if you could rate and review it, or better still, share it with folk who may value a gem or two. Any book recommendations, quotes, songs can be found in the show notes and on the website too. Until the next time, however tough these times get, keep that very special inner sparkle you have shining. Hope and Patience with Amelia Rope. Join the conversation at hopeandpatience.co.uk. Find Amelia on Facebook at Hope and Patience or on Twitter and Instagram at Amelia underscore Rope.